Good. OK. So now what we're going to do is to have a, a, an introduction to the small talk bytecode. You have already seen quite of that uh, up to this point. We're going to try to give some kind of structure to, to what you have seen and try to see if someone has some questions about it, right? So. Uh, basically, the objective of generating uh, the reason for working with bytecodes is that we can generate different kind of bytecodes, right? And we can we can implement compilers for other languages. So we can uh, remove the the, the bytecode generation that we have, put another bytecode generation, and generate uh, instead of bytecode something else, right? So any other language. Is that okay? Good. Uh, You mean squeak bytecode? Is there any, any compiler for another language including squeak bytecode? Well, I don't know. Yes, I did one. Yeah. So for people who've done a Pascal, um, uh, there's new speak is compiled to uh, squeak bytecode. Um, uh, Ian P. Martin has done a, a Lisp. Um, and uh, one of the things to realize is that the debugger um, is generic the way that you map from the bytecode to highlighting the source is just based on, on source ranges, from, you know, from this character to that character. So if you write a compiler for a different language, when you, uh, if you do it right in the same way that the compiler works, you will end up with a fully interactive IDE for that, for that language. So it's a fun thing to do. And I would really encourage anybody who is interested to, to choose their own favorite language and compile it to squeak bytecode. It's a really instructive thing, and you get a really nice result. Cool. Is that okay? Good. Uh, so then we have we can do analysis, uh, we can do the compilation, com the printing of bytecode, and then interpretation. We have the, the debugger and the profiler, right? These are things that we can do. So uh, you have already seen a lot of of the things already. So we have the the virtual machine, right? So you know what that is. Provides. Uh, the virtual processor and the bytecode, that's the machine code that it runs, right? And uh, a small talk, the, the, the bytecode small talk is a, a stack based bytecode, right? So basically, every, every single bytecode works on the stack. So the other representations of, of bytecode, which are, like for instance, three other representations, which was what uh, C uses, but uh, that's, what, that's what small talk uses. It's a stack based bytecode representation, right? There are some properties for each of them. There are some advantages and some disadvantages. That's why some optimizations work much better in a, a three others based uh, bytecode, and sometimes some other optimizations in stack based. But that's generally not the case. Okay, and the squeak bean, as you have seen, is implementing a slang, right? Any anybody have questions about this? Okay, so you have seen this already. But as Steph said, it's good to repeat. So we're going to repeat. What? Teaching means repeating. Yeah, <laughs> that's good. That's much, much more philosophical, right? So that's good. Yeah, I'm not in this kind of detail. <laughs> good. So, uh, so, yeah, so a compile method. What's the structure of the compile method? If you look at what we have already shown, the compile method is composed of a header, that's a, this number with this weird number. Then we have. Uh, then we have the literals, right, the list of literals, and then we have the bytecode and a trailer, right? So this is the pointer to the source code. Might happen that you don't have that, right? So in some cases you can have compile method that doesn't have, but that doesn't matter. Uh, and what it looks like is something like that. See, you see, you have uh, the header, which is this weird thing, and then you have the literals in this case. And uh, in here you can see the bytecodes, and basically these are the bytecodes that are there. Is that okay. Do we see an example again? That's good? Okay. So we will see a little bit more afterwards. So this particular example is for uh, ask integer, right? So this is for inspecting. So basically you can access that. So this is important. If you say number, right? Uh, this symbol and ask integer, basically what you get there is a compile method. Is that okay? This is kind of traditional stuff. And then if we inspect that, we get uh, the inspector of the compile method. 
right? And then you can access uh, the compile method in another way. It's like method dictionary. Do you know this structure? So every uh, every class has a method dictionary in which the compile methods are stored, right? And they are indexed by uh, by a symbol. So okay. Yep. Good. Yeah. So the trailer is a point. Number of uh, bytecode is in the trailer. The number of bytecode. So, so the byte. How will we figure out uh, where we start the, the starting of the trailer? I want. To well, what do you mean? When? When? It, yeah, it's it's, 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 it's a number. Yes, yeah, it's a pointer to the source code, right? So it's the last part. Yes, but you say sometimes it's there, sometimes sometimes sometimes. Sometimes you don't have the bytecode, right? So it, it can be zero. So yeah. Okay, it's zero. Yeah, so yeah. yeah. It's, there's always the the, human, the, the four bytes. Yeah, <laughs> but it can happen, right? And, and if you forget to uh, add the train, yeah, it if can get even more strange. When I started to play with this stuff, I did not understand the trainer. And uh, then you get nice crashes. <laughs> Is that okay, Nuri? Is that good? Okay. Okay. Oh, wait, one thing. Uh, for the header, Elliot went into detail of what are the different things. Any questions about that? Again? And, and one can see that this It's a, sto it's, it's a stolen slide, don't worry. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. That doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. Okay. And block methods are for the yeah. Okay, don't look at that slide anymore. <laughs> well, good. All right. Uh, so we have two types of bytecode mainly. So they have single and multiple, right? So single by bytecodes are kind of uh, push self, right? So we have to push the self object into the stack. Or uh, we have the push temps, so we have up to 31, we have different push temps on different so push, uh, push temp, push inst bars, uh, so on. And then we have the multiple bytecodes. So sometimes it's just four bits, right, for the offset are not enough, it's too small. So in the case of champs, we need perhaps more. So as we are going to see, the, so the bytecodes, this is the first part, which is the type, so which one of all these is a push, is it a return, and so on. And then we have the opposite, in the case that we want to, uh, we index where, right, in the liters, or where do we want to uh, move on, right? Is that clear? We are going to see examples in which we, uh, this is one one byte uh, bytecode example. We're going to see in the closure implementation that there are four bytes uh, bytecode. Okay, much more complicated structure, right? Good. So, uh, if we have a simple example, this is a definition of a method which just sends a message to truncate to self and returns that. So, if we transform that to, to bytecode, what we get is self. This means, when you see this, this means that this self is being pushed. This is the way we are going to see it in the pretty print. Uh, this is the code, this is the actual bytecode code uh, in EXA, right? And then we have the send, and we send the message truncate, truncate it. And then we return the top. So basically the result of the send is push, right? It's, it consumes this one, right? It consumes itself and is pushed in the stack. So that in the top is going to be the return of the truncated. Is that clear? Who did understand? Who didn't understand? It didn't work this asking questions thing. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Not using it anymore. Is that okay? Yes. Good. So, uh, this is a detailed explanation for you to, to use afterwards if you want, but basically it's that the receiver self, right, is pushed on the stack. Uh, then this is the bytecode 208, it's a send literal selector. So this is a send literal, so this is the literal. And this is of course going to be in the literal, in the literal list, in the compile method. And uh, uh, yeah, so we get, so basically what it says is that we get the first literal. So this is going to be an index on the literals. And we then start to look up in the class, right? And the result is push and stack. That was what we saw, right? And we read that. <coughs> Good. Questions? Good. So uh, we have 256 bytecodes. So there are four groups. So we have the type bytecodes, the send bytecodes, 
the return and the charm bike. So the stacks are basically the push, the pops, and the dots, right? And uh, on the jump bike, because we have uh, we have long jumps and uh, short jumps, so we can jump different positions in the in the structure of compartments, right? So we can we can say that. Good. So we start by because these are examples. For example, we have uh, we can push and pop ten bags on instance bars and literals. This goes from the sixteen to the thirty one as as uh, as indexes, if you want. You mean in constraints with the Actual false object and progress with the with the not capitalized. Mm, well, well, it's, it's you capitalize the the word false to ah, false to limit. Yeah. Actually, yeah. Boolean and not the classes. No, 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 no. That's right. That's never. Yeah. Okay. Good. Uh, then we can push self this context, and we can duplicate the top of stack and pop. It's a kind of stack base bycode. Uh, so then we have different kind of sense. We have normal sense, we have super sense, and we have hard coded sense for efficiency, right? So we we can uh, specifically say what we have we want to have, and this is a little bit faster. Uh, so for instance, the the plus and the minus are examples of that. If you want, you can check in that. <coughs> what do you mean hard coded? You mean there is something? This is something. Uh, so when instead of, of the yeah, so instead yeah, so instead of actually doing the send, right? You have this uh, way of saying, okay, go here, right? Yeah, so, so, so what, it, what it actually is, is that there is a special send plus bytecode, which does exactly the same as if it would be do a send uh, with offset five, yeah, there, there is a plus. It's, it's the same, only that it does not need to uh, do the, to do this, so it, it, it's, it's faster in a way. And the other thing is that it is uh, more complex. What, what then uh, uh, was what's done is that the plus is not uh, in the say cinematic the symbol is not there is only the bytecode um, and, and do you remember Nori that in, in when I was looking at the special objects array there was a, an array which looked like plus one minus one etc so mm -hmm. the, the bytecode is an index into that table so that table says the bytecode 176 is that selector and it has this many arguments so there's like 32 bytecodes uh, which encode for arithmetic and, and things like at and at put, and they save a lot of space. But the interpreter is free then if it knows that, that, that you know uh, 176 is plus to say, well, if the two things on the top of the stack are integers, I'll just shortcut the whole lookup process and I'll just do it in place. Right. So yep. it's even faster than using the cache to uh, Right. I mean, it was essential to the interpreter. So, so when small talk was only interpreters, when, it was, was, when you only had the standard speech interpreter or when you only had a microcoded machine executing the bytecode, it sped up integer arithmetic enormously. Right. But uh, no, no, my, my, my question is, is that, uh, is that still make sense to have this? If you in have the, the interpreter, it absolutely makes sense. In the JIT, it makes no difference. But remember that what still makes sense is the space saving. And one of the things that I discussed with Peter Joyce when I was a student, which they then did, when I when I arrived at Parkway, I found out that they did, was um, when Smalltalk started, it was a 16-bit implementation. And so the byte saves you uh, um, basically 16 bits in a literal frame. Right? But uh, in the 32 <coughs> bit system, uh, a, a byte saves you now uh, four bytes in the literal frame. So a two-byte byte code which, which can encode 256 special literals can still save you because now you've got two bytes instead of the one byte for the byte plus the four bytes in the literal frame. If you look at visual works, there's also a, um, a, 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 a bytecode that encodes for up to 256 common selectors. Right? And so that's not an optimizing bytecode, that's just a space saving bytecode. So there's a bytecode that says that I am a send for this big table system-wide, and that saves you um, saves you two bytes instead of saving you three bytes. Of course, it makes standards off slower because you need to iterate over the whole bytecode if you want to find all right. the standards of plus. Right. Right. What did you say, Matthew? What is so if you want to look at all standards of okay, plus. Okay, senders. Okay, now I need to look at that. Right. The, problem, the problem is that you know to find the senders of plus, you can't just look in the literal frame. You have to look through the bytecode to find out. 
Pike goes 176, and no, no word to whether it's, it's referencing Pike. And then there are other things in the visual word byte codes, like uh, a byte code that encodes for an integer between minus 128 and plus uh, 127, whereas in this byte code, the only compactness is minus 1, 0, 1, and 2. Right? And so there are byte codes for true and false. So basically, what byte code is, is two things. One is, it should be an easily interpretable um, uh, token for token relationship to your source code. It should be as close to your source code as possible to make things like the decompiler and the debugger as easy. Right? But the other thing it is, is basically a con an encoding trick. It's, it's a compression technique. Right? And so you know, over, the, <coughs> over the years, that looking at it as a, as a compression technique has changed as the system's changed from 16-bit to 32-bit and, and the whole series of tricks that you can you can play in order to get compact bytecode without sacrificing the ease of interpretability. So, so bytecode is, 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 a, is a, a, a quite a plastic thing. And one of the reasons that I have of, of really encouraging the Faro group to push with this nuts um, uh, bootstrap is so that when we bootstrap from source, we can experiment with new, new bytecode sets. Because you shouldn't be wedded to this ancient bytecode set. Bytecode set should be something that you can experiment with and, and play encoding tricks. Okay. Good. All right. So when then we have the returns. Is that okay? Do it. Yeah. Okay. Good. And then we have the returns, and uh, we can return uh, from a method from a block. Uh, and we have a special bytecode for re for return self, nil, true, false, right? For efficiency, essentially. So. Uh, example. So we have a, here we have a jump bike. So let's take a look. We, we talked about that already. But how do they look like? So if we have a simple example where we have a comparison, and if true, true, what we have is first we push the constant one, right? We push the constant two, right? And this end, of course, has a parameter. So it, it's going to consume two elements in the stack. So, okay. Good. Uh, so what's going to happen after that? After I push, I do the send. Well, in the stack you have a boolean. That's right. So the result of the evaluation of this is going to be pushed in the stack. Is that okay? So then this jump is going to evaluate that. If it's false, it's going to jump to 15. And this is why these numbers are there, right? Otherwise, it's just going to go on, right? So if it's true, it's going to go in. Is that okay? So then we have to push the constant true, which is a string. And if after that, we have to jump, right, and return top. Otherwise, we have this, which is not perhaps clear, which is we push constant nil, right? Why? Should be so. Huh? What? I can answer if you want. You can answer. So uh, there is of course the false case, and um, the we evaluate a, a false um, block. The value of that is nil. So that's why that's what is here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's not a good example. <laughs> All right. So what what is the correct result from this uh, uh, expression? I mean, what is expected from from the <coughs> point of view? From the development point of view. Yeah. Uh, if you look at these expressions, the the least uh, expected value is 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 nil. Is what? Is nil. Sorry. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Sorry. Yeah. So, uh, 
assume that we have the uh, te test uh, expression which answers uh, false, then uh, the if true will not be evaluated. Yep. And the, the result of whole expression, assuming uh, to the bytecode, it is new. Yeah. And uh, for me, a more appropriate value, a result of expression is false. Because you have the condition, and condition answers either true or false, and then you have an optional. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I understand, yeah. But th this is what is the semantic of if true. If yeah, that's if, this, if, if true, so if false with empty block. And then what is the semantic of empty block? Uh, if you evaluate a val uh, an empty block, what do you get? And you get new. And this is why you have this thing as well. Okay. <laughs> Don't concentrate too much into that. It was a bad example. My my fault. <coughs> no, but I never like that. Uh, yeah, it's, it's yeah, but that that's. It's not it's useful value. I I understand, right? I understand. <laughs> is what? It's a different discussion. Yeah, that's right. No, I understand. But yeah, that's how. Perhaps we we can change it, right? So that's not a big deal. Well, you Good. Can change it and then everything breaks. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> that's it. So, and there is something new, right? Which are the closure bikers. So this is the big stuff. So what we discussed before was that we are going to start needing this uh, this pushing of uh, of actually this copying of values and this ten vector, right? So actually, what Elliot did was to introduce these uh, five main bikers. So we are going to go in order. So they are really they look ugly here. That's <laughs> <laughs> it's just I should have done something else, right? But they look like this. so. This is what you're going to see in the description. But the basic I, I, what, what I would like to describe, describe is what are they useful for, right? So perhaps we have to start with this one, which is the push closure, right? So every time you're going to find a block, what's going to happen is that you're going to call instead of the previous uh, push new uh, push new context, you're going to have this bytecode. And this bytecode, what it says is I would like to copy this number of uh, this number of temps. So basically, you have to push them in the stack before calling this. This is done by the compiler. So you don't have to do anything. So what is happening is that this guy is going to push uh, the, the stuff that you want to copy. In the case of the example that I showed, the index, the, the collection, and the block, this last example that we saw, in which the index was remote, we are going to, co we are going to push both collection and, in, um, and block. And we are going to push. Uh, the remote attempt to because those are the three things that we need inside the block. Is that clear? Yeah. Eh? Show us. Yeah, yeah. We are going to show an example now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to show an example. Just I wanted to have the the insight. Now the question is, if I'm doing so, this is when I have the block. So the question is, how do I create this remote thing? So these are remote things. How do they work? So basically, what we have is this. Bytecode, which is the push array new, right? So we, I can create an k size, right? Uh, a k size element, right? In the ten vector, is that okay? And then we have the the push, right? And the stores on the ten vector. So we cannot access the, this remote this in, uh, remote ten vector with normal. Uh, bytecode. We have to use special bytecode. Yes. Yeah, that, yeah, that's so like, that, that, that's yeah, that's more. more, more bytecode. That's right. So this is and these are four byte bytecodes. So they are long stuff. So you're going to see them like really big. Now. Is that okay? Good. Let's try to see it. Okay.
No, that's too complicated. Just a second, eh? Wait on me. Okay. Are we all, all right. So I took the sorry. I took this example that we were looking at before. Is that okay? Any questions about the example? So it's basically Yeah, it's a so global, it's yeah. Two different contexts at the same time can access the same scope. Is that okay? Is that okay? Okay, so I took the this example before, right? So what do you think it should happen here? Is there a remote or not? I'm just asking. <laughs> Can you read that, or it's too small? Yeah. 
Actually, there are plenty of examples like that in the test. So we have to build all those in order to be able to test the closure implementation. You will yeah, see. I'm very lazy. I'm not very good at coming up with that. <laughs> So, who has a go? Who says that there is a remote and who says that there is no remote? Who says there is a remote? Who says that there is no remote? Okay, there is no remote. Okay, so, yeah, basically. Who didn't answer? Who didn't answer? At least half of you. Yeah. Come on. All right, so, yeah, basically because. Actually, there's a nice quote on that. that it says that we are squandered. So, we are re so we, when we go through the education system, we are removed the capacity to. So, errors are stigmatized, right? So, we are kind of. They, they remove this natural inquisition or actually questioning uh, that kids have. So, when we are grown up, we are afraid of being wrong, which is quite wrong. Because if you're not ready, you're not uh, ready to be wrong, then you're not ready to have anything. You're not the chance to have anything creative. I stole that from someone. Eh? It's not mine. <laughs> okay, good. Anyway, so yeah, everything is fine, right? So, but everything is not fine. It's just that we don't have a remote. We don't have to create a remote term vector. So, if we look at the bytecode, uh, this big thing here, that's the closure number. That's it. That's the closure copy, right? So we are copying the closure, and we are saying that. Uh, right, we have only one argument. Why do we have one argument? So I put it down there. What do I need in the block, in the first block? I have one argument, right? Am I copying something in the block? Into the block, am I copying something? Do I need something in the block? No, no. that's why the number says zero. So I'm not copying anything. That's, that's, that's true, that's, that's the tricky part, right? So there are one there, right, and one inside. Okay, and then I, so of course I have to push uh, the first value because, because there is an argument, and then I immediately have to hit the second block, right? So I do it again, another closure, right? And now, do I have arguments in this block? No, no. but what did it change? What does it change in this one? It's yeah, it, it's copying one thing because I need the argument that comes from outside. Is that clear? And these things over here are the size of the block. Up to what position does it go, right? Kind of uh, enclosing of the block, both here and here. Is that okay? Yeah? And then we can see the push. So we, we are pushing a temp, which is the argument one. And then we are doing block return, block return for the two different blocks. Is that okay? Question? So, let's play. The only, only comment I think that not copy, but I think map appropriate logic to capture arguments. Mm, we, so, does it mean the same, or do you have a problem with the word, or what? No, I mean, so you see the... Actually, the, the, the values are copied, right? That's that's what's happening. It's not. Yeah. But, yeah, but you want another word? So what's wait wait, wait sorry. What's yeah. the what's the problem that you have with that word? Wanted to say that suppose that you want to pass an expression to to some uh, closure. Yep. And at some point you want you you could actually uh, do not evaluate this expression before uh, entering. The but evaluate it at the point where, where it's used, the, the real value. Yep. Yeah. And it's a, this is the... Yep, the it's a different story, right? The argument is the way of capturing the value yep. of, of previous expression into passive argument. I agree, but 
It's a different story, right? Okay. It's <laughs> all right, good. So it's, everybody's happy with this? So did you see what I did here? Okay, so now what's wrong? Or what, what should happen? Or what would you expect to see? Is there any, so who is for that this is a remote? Uh, sorry, here. Why? Because we cannot assign two arguments. I just compile it. <laughs> All right. It, it, wait, 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 wait. It works for me. Eh? Okay. What's. Yeah, so, yeah, Harry. Yeah, that's the question I. Uh, actually had earlier because when you showed us the uh, IR interpretation um, in the RB version you only had to have the argument of the temp and I was wondering if there was special handling of, of temps also the other way over arguments or not because no. you can't assign two arguments so it's a special kind of temp yeah but this wait wait but this is an argument so this is inside the block yeah I know, but, but, okay. uh, but during the generation so the process when you when you Made the AST and stuff. Um, the the um, I, scope yeah. can actually check that. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. But uh, I mean, in, in the scope, um, you only have uh, temps, for example. Yeah, but the temps know if they are asked or not. Okay, so the yeah, so the, you, uh, can you can ask the temp, yeah, yeah if it's an argument yeah, or. What's missing is that it does not uh, raise an error or whatnot. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah, it depends. For, from my point of view, it depends on the behavior. So if they are the same, so the behavior is the same, the is just for one thing. I mean, you ask uh, the yeah, arguments yeah, by push yeah. temps, yeah. that's why, why it's like that. Yeah, but it's, it's driven by the bytes. Yeah, it's driven by the bytes. Yeah. Well, I don't know. Do you, do you want to see this one, or the, does this create some crisis in you? I can. <laughs> So, what is new here? So yeah, there is a remote, right? <laughs> so I, I am showing a bug. Okay, good. What I want to show you. What it looks like. It looks exactly like normal code. Yeah, but it works differently. <laughs> okay, but what I wanted to show you is this part here, right? What is that? Yeah, that's the remote, right? So that's the special bytecode. I'm sorry, before I didn't show you, but do you, so do you see that these are four bytecode things, right? So they are bigger bytecode. Okay, cool. And this is where I'm creating the remote. I only create it here because it's inside this block that I need it. If I would need it outside, then it will be created the first thing in the in the compile method, right? So if I need it in several blocks and different contexts, this will be created. In, it's created where it's required, only once. Okay. So. Uh, what doesn't you so here as you can see I'm I'm uh, I'm I'm putting this uh, remote temp in the temp one right and then I'm pushing it so th I'm not doing it right so this is all done by the compiler but then I push it and then I say okay I'm, I want to copy that one right so basically what this means is that it's going to take this one here right and copy it as a temp in the closure is that clear no Okay. It run. You want to run it? It's going to break, eh? <laughs> Wait, what is not clear? I'm, I'm coming. So this is the same. This is the same as before. What? Okay. Yeah. So do you see that here? Look, I define it here. I put it. I pop it right because he's, this here was pushed. It was pushed. Then I pop it there in the temp one. And then I push it again, right? And that means you that can, you can actually remove these two bytecodes because they are. Yeah, that's. 
Yeah, absolutely. But that's another part of the compiler. For now, it's okay. <laughs> it's a clear. It's clear like that. It's for uh, educational purposes. <laughs> no, that, that's that's true. But we are going to remove them so we can see more clearly. <laughs> Is that okay, Nuri? Yes. Okay, so that's what's being copied. You can copy any amount of uh, of uh, temps that you want. Okay, into a nuclear shell. This is for arguments. Okay. Questions? No, that's good. Okay. Yeah, oh, sorry. Can you bring that back up again? Yeah. No. No, it's just a way of, way of sharing <coughs> an L value between activation and stuff. It's just a, a way of, of, of having a, a, a slot or something that lots of different things can get to. What, what, what's the problem? They're going to be arrays. <coughs> no, they're all arrays. They're all arrays. And that bytecode, that bytecode is, is, a, is a create array. Bytecode is just shorthand for having array in the literal frame and sending it to the use column with an argument. So instead of saying push literal variable array, push however many slots you need, send new colon, which takes a long time, there's one bytecode that says create an array of this size. And because we have tuples in sweep, because you know with curly brackets, curly brackets creates an array of expressions, right? So that you might as well, because you know nobody needs temp, uh, 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 these temp vectors to have 256 elements. I mean, probably the biggest one in the system is an eight or something like that. But I chose to make the bytecode also create tuples. And so the top bit decides whether you just create a new array or whether you create an array and pop that in there. And that bytecode can also be used to create tuples. Uh, in, in Europe, we're going to have um, three modes inside blocks. Yeah, only, only if you have a 17 block that you ever create a remote. Well, and something I haven't explained that is here, right? So it's this is another special bytecode, right, in which we are storing the value that we wanted. So this is the constant that we pushed here. We are storing it in the remote vector. Okay, that's why is that there. So we cannot access this uh, this ten vector like that, right? So we need a special bytecode for that. Is that okay? Yes. So the question why we need two extremes if they in vector add because if you have the only for, for that whole method you have only one vector, it will be all always the first uh, temp in the context. And then you don't have to specify this uh, in vector add No wait, so so the problem is that, so you said that, can you synthesize some example where you have in vector add parameter to be other than zero? In vector add parameter, so this is just, you mean this zero here? Yeah, if you have an argument. This is the second one. Yeah. Second one. Yeah, yeah. second one got argument with nothing. Yeah, but exactly. So yeah. You just have an A1. You, you want to put that here? In front of it. Yeah. In front of it. In front of it. That's it. So like that? Right. And now it has to be into... No, no, you're right. It, it, um, so, um, okay. Just imagine we have... Yeah, well, they said, uh, you mean the, the indexing. So there's a thing that I discovered that I don't know how to explain it, but actually the indexing in the nuclear share is different from the indexing before. So there's a new re-indexing, and there is some kind of organization which is not very... Pretty... After zero, no. <laughs> no, 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 hang on, hang on, hang on, guys. First, first of all, the, the why the, um, what happens is that when the compiler decides to make things remote, it always adds the temporary to the remote after all of the other temporary. Yes. The temporary that holds the remote always ends up being the last one. Yes. Right. But the question of, 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 of 
whether the, the uh, major index is, is zero or one is how many variables yeah. need to be made remote. As soon as you have some method which has more than one variable remote, then you'll get a non-zero index. And they're rare, but they do exist. So right. can, you, can you explain the block? Uh, first block or second block? So you want to do A0? No, no, you need to add, add the argument to the second block, not to the first block. Then you will see. Okay. So remove the A1 in the first block. And add the A1 argument. Is that okay? Ah, oh, sorry, I didn't assign it. No, it's, it's just a chain, I think. You want to see? Okay. So it's actually shows which term of blocks are uh, vectors. Yeah. Uh, because this is flat. Yeah. Yeah. Because this pattern is so clear. Yep. Is that okay? All right. Let's move on because otherwise. Okay. Any question? Okay. Let's move on. Oops. Uh, so that, that was the closure bikers. There's much more where that came from, but well. You can play with examples. Uh, you will see uh, a test with a bunch of examples and all these different cases. Of course, these are not complete, so if you want to propose new cases. And they are failing tests, so they are fixed. Yeah, that's true, <laughs> as you saw. OK, so we arrived at, perhaps this is the most important part or the most interesting one, and we can play more. So thinking with bytecode is quite hard, but perhaps with IR it's going to be simple. So, uh, the IR, so the main object here is the IR builder, right? So it's the object that we should talk to in order to create an IR method. Uh, it's again, like an assembler for far now that we have the IR. So, uh, example. Uh, we create an IR builder, right? We instantiate it. And then we push the receiver. The push receiver is basically push self, right? And then we send, this is the tradition example of truncated. We send truncate, and then we return the top, right? And then we call IR on the new, on the IR builder. And to the IR, we can send compile method. We already saw that. And then we can do value with receiver 3.5, and we get three. That's the answer, is that okay? I'm not going to show that. You can try it out in your images if you want. Good. So how do we manipulate it? You're going to see that it's very similar to the bytecode, but what is abstracts away is this, this problem of dealing with just what we discussed right now, all these indexes, right? So which is one, which is zero, and all the jumps. So the jumps are to a specific uh, name it, uh, named labels, right? Not to jump to position 100 something. Is that clear? So in that way, it's much more simpler. And when we do changes to that, we have a intermediate level in which we can adapt these jumps and we can adapt the temps. Is that okay? The indexing. So we have, yeah, we have pop top, the part, uh, push tab, and push literal, push receiver, and push this context. So it's, so let's see the, a similar example that we saw before. So for, false if true, true if false, false. Is that good? So again, the builder, push literal, false, uh, jump ahead. So the, Jump ahead, ahead to false, right? So where am I jumping to? Target, false, okay? So that's the way it works. That's a way to define labels here. Uh, so then we do a push literal of true, right? And then we jump ahead to end, so we'll be here. And then we have, in the target false, we do the false, right? That's here. And then we do, uh, well, basically, this is the jump ahead and return top IR. So then we, we create the IR. Is that OK? Questions? Good. So instance variables. Actually, this is OK. Sorry. Uh, so we access by offset, right? So 
We can do that, and actually we can do names. I'm going to show you an example now, which is going to be more clear than this. Uh, basically, what I'm doing here, it's a, it's a point. I'm sending a point, right? And I just want to change the instant, the first instance variable. So I'm sending basically one, two, that's a point. And what I, get, I want to change that to two, right? So basically what I do is push literal two, right? Store in bar at one, so I want to store this value here, that what I pushed, in the first instance variable, which is that one. And I push to receive a self, and then I return top. Is that okay? Questions? Okay, this is much better. Good. Uh, so before we saw access by index, right? So we also can access by name, which is much simpler. So we can have both words if you want. So uh, here what I'm doing is basically I add temps, so I define that it's going to be all these temps, name A and B. I push literal one, right? I store the temp, so I, I can refer to it as a name temp instead of just having to deal with indexes. And then I push literal two. I store temp B, I push temp B, and then I return top. What is happening? What does all this mean? Well, actually, it's written there, right? Is that okay? Yeah? Okay, so these are ways of playing with this. Okay? Yeah. The model right now is that methods are kind of independent of, of the class. So that's why uh, it does not, I mean, you would not need it to know the class if you would talk about names at that point. Mm -hmm. Because only the class knows the, the name, the object. And the way that this most of the compiler is structured is that it lets you compile a method kind of in relatively independent. Yeah, that's true. That's one of the main things. You need to think about that. I, I don't like it too much. I... Okay. Then we have normal sense, which is basically to a builder, to a IR builder, we can say send this literal, right? Uh, and then we have super send, super send which is uh, we have to specify the class, right? Is that okay? Good. So. So what I want to do here is like, okay, so we have this nice IR builder. Uh, what, what kind of things can I do? So what I would like to do, and, and discussing with Marcus, we came with, with, with an example, a very simple example, which is uh, what I could do is, so this is the OC instance bar, emit to store, right? So I have an instance bar. I'm going to go with that. Sorry. Wait. So, sorry. What I want to do is to be able to transform the IR somehow, right? So I want to be able to modify what is happening. So basically, this code here. Where? <laughs> where what? Where is what happening? Right? Where are you now? Uh, okay, I'm going to that. So no, yeah, but you need to now say where. What? What is that? Yeah, I'm going to that. Yeah, yeah. Wait a second. <laughs> You're breaking my story. <laughs> I'm only motivated now. Okay. Yeah, that's true. I perhaps I'm jumping too far. So uh, this emit store it's going to it's going to happen uh, at in the OC so in the in this instance variable that we have, we are going to call in the in the generation of the bike, we're going to call uh, these messages emit store and in order to create when we go through the uh, the tree structure, we're going to go and try to build uh, yeah. No, no, we need to go, go go back a step. So we are now back in the compiler. Yes. And because you didn't mention, because we were just talking about IR Builder as an as a as, a, as an assembler, which you can use completely yes. independently, and we are now back in the. In so the now my, my my story is like we are. What what if you want to change what is happening yeah, in the compiler? The small talk compiler. The compiler, yeah. Right. Because we were used to be just in IR, and you explained. Why yeah, yeah, yeah. But now we're yeah. We are yeah. Now back in the small talk to. Uh, 
Yeah, so we want to change what's hap happening in the compiler. Is that okay? Yeah, but you need to mention that. Yeah, everybody's the same page? Okay, let's just start over again. So the objective is I want to compile something, right? And I want that when I, ha I am accessing an instance variable, right? I would like, instead of doing the traditional thing, which would be just to, uh, to store the instance variable where it belongs, I would like to do something extra, right? So I would do, instead of doing the traditional thing, I would like to do something else. Is that okay? That's my objective, just to do a very simple and idiotic change in the IR representation, right? In order to have a different behavior at the end. That's a big picture, is that okay? A very simple thing, now much more complicated thing, this is a simple example, is that okay? Good, so this is what happens when uh, I access an instance variable, right, in the representation of uh, the compiler in the IR, and when I'm building the IR, right, when, I, when I'm actually building the IR, so when I'm going to AST transformations, right, so I'm going to AST transformer, from the AST to the IR, what is happening is that a visitor, which is the AST transformer, are going to be visiting every single node in the AST tree, okay? And it's going to uh, try to, to, to send the method builder and each of the different parts of this AST is going to do something to the method builder, which is an IR builder. Is that okay? So in this AST transformer visitor, what you can do is to change what should happen to the IR builder, right? To have different behavior different behavior to the traditional one. It's like, okay. Yep. Everybody understood kind of the objective? Okay. So, what if I do something like that? So the, that's the traditional thing, so I just want to do a store in SPAR, right? That's what would be traditional, but perhaps I do something like that. What does that mean? What am What am I doing? You're replacing a directed by a return to. You're not storing. So you're saying that between that node you can redefine it for app, to object, and have a return for who you are. So That's you right. So basically, the idea is I know that I'm not storing, but the the cool part is that you can you can store here or whatever. But then here you can also say something else that should happen. Basically, here we're sending a message, and. In a particular implementation, oh, I think you made a mistake. We did not change the store to uh, to region. Yeah. We started. We didn't change the store to. So we we started to implement the store and then we uh, changed it. We we changed our story, but we forgot to change the init store to init. Uh, and read. Root. Yeah. Emit. Emit read. read. Emit yeah, that's example, okay. Yeah. Change it on the fly. Change it on the fly. <laughs> yeah, but that's not on the fly. We will see it in the image now. Okay. My point is that you can change this thing. On is that clear? <laughs> is that clear? I go home. After. Yeah, no, but I think that, yes, I think because I was wondering what did you do with the store then? But okay, this is the Yeah, no, actually, I tried this out. Wait, wait, I tried this out and it breaks a hill. Yeah, but, but this uh, is because you missed. missed yeah, but no, there was something else too. So no. okay, okay, that's not the Okay. But my point is not to show, that's why I'm showing it here. It's not to see that we can do it. It's like we can change, right? How they are, so we can change at different, spets, uh, at different steps. And in particular here, we're changing the IR generation, right? We can get a different representation from the AST, where we, where we parse, we can get a different representation of IR with changes that then can go. And this is what happened in Albetia and uh, reflectivity in Albetia. Okay, yeah. I have a question, because this is not the design level. Here, you are changing the, the method emit read whatever yeah. on the instance variable, so on your, on your read. Yeah, yeah, that's I I understand that. No, no, that, that's a that's a really valid uh, statement on that. So I think that that comes from the original uh, architecture of the compiler, right? So there are many things I can that yeah. So the basically is that this, they send this message, like for instance, I meet, which this is kind of from the old compiler. This comes from there. And they send these messages to these options and they have to decide what to do, which is perhaps not the right place to do. A double dispatching would be much better, right? So, well, look, I need to do something on you. I would like to know. And then the guy says, yeah, well, you have to do something about me. That I, I am this kind, right? I, I would see through the method builder as something that follows the, the semantics of the bytecode. So you would not 
change in a subclass of method builder what what to do, but because that it's not really uh, that subtle that is. But then why not the other thing? Is that you use the method builder to build the method? Is it ever the user that does this yeah. behavior here? Yeah. Which then has something to do with implicit German and just the same tree. Yeah, for me, is that th yeah, yeah, this is inherited from the uh, from the previous one. Better. I think that that's a better solution, but that's my I didn't try it out, right? No, no, but I, I agree on that. So that's the way to go. Yeah, I I agree on that. I I believe that's the way to go, but I haven't tried it out, so I cannot justify it. Okay. Okay. So let's forget about this horrible example, and. The problem also is that, uh, so this is global, right? So I touch this and the compiler is going to hit everywhere, everywhere, everybody. So it's kind of the control, we don't have much control. So what I'm going to do, what time is it? Okay, we have done. So what I'm going to do is to describe quickly what is byte solution. So this is a tool, which was built by Marcus, on top the the Opel compiler, right? So let's try to try to see what we can do. And Basically, a byte, a byte solution is just a, a library for doing byte adaptation, right? So for those of you who are uh, aware of, uh, for instance, Java Assist, which is a Java byte code adaptation, this is kind of uh, not the same, but it's kind of uh, in the same spirit, if you want. But it's not the same, completely different, in the, in the way that you do it, okay? So we also want to do that. This is something for runtime transformations, right? So I have the byte code there. I want to touch it at runtime. Okay, in Java that's not completely possible. There's some tricks to that, but that's not good. Okay, and something nice is this MOPS. So MOPS is uh, meta object protocols, and AOP is aspect of program. So you can achieve this kind of techniques by doing this. Basically, there are uh, some uh, Java uh, reflective tools, for instance, Reflex, which was then what motivated reflectivity, which tries to achieve MOPS and AOP. From a, from Java Assist, right? So they do Java Assist in order to get this in Java. So okay, good. Uh, right, example. So the goal is just to have a log, right? So we have an example self test, and then I do a transcript show, right? This is, it will be by hand, okay? So the question is, how do I do it, not by hand? So how do I do it by adapting the bytecode at runtime instead of touching the code, right? And going through the whole process. So uh, what I basically do is I get the compile method, and now the compile method is extended with new behavior, which is, for instance, oh, sorry, for instance, this instrument send, right? So what I want to do is to instrument the message send. I want to do something else, right, when the message send is done. So basically, I receive the send there, and I have send insert before. So this is uh, this is the the abstraction which I, I can I can say instead of before instead of after right and then I do this. So now the question is, what is that? Wait, change? Do you have a cascade? No, no, no. What do you? you have Do you mean from the point of view of insert before, insert yeah. after? Yeah. What is the insert before, insert after? Okay, so basically you have to think that the representation of this is kind of AST-like, right? So you have this uh, this way of looking at as a cascade, right? So you have different things that are happening. So you can, when you say insert before, insert after, actually this insert before is defined by the node, right? So you can adapt to this. So each node, in this case, is going to be sent, right? You can say, okay, if I am in the cascade, then I have to say, my, I have to talk to my parent. I have to delegate to my parent. The implementation is like, insert before me to the parent, and the parent, okay, you are, I, I'm in cascade, so you have to be careful. Uh, so if you look at what, what cascades are uh, compiled away on the level of the bytecode, so. Yeah. If the, the send is the IR, the send node, and cascade, you don't see it that way. But the cascade, what, what was the issue? So the point is that when you have continuation, Method message out. I mean, if you have an expression where, where the argument to one message sent yeah. is another, is the result of, of an 
another method. Yeah. So this one inserts just before the bytecode, so it's ah, stack it's is it just operates on bytecode. Well. Right. It's yeah, yeah. Sorry. That wait, wait. So no, it operates on the bytecode. But code in, instead, before the sandwich going to the another strand as argument, so no. it makes it okay. Really, it really inserts in front of the bytecode in a way that you could not uh, do it on the abstractivity level because yeah. it does it when the stack is in the state where the send could be done. Because I mean, for if you have the message sent as a argument to, to another, you don't have the sequence of uh, 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 of nodes. You have only one node which represents the argument of, of you. So yeah. Instead, before it was made. Uh, I'll show you an example. So yeah, basically that was that was my bad. Basically, what also happening is that depending on where you you adapt the bytecode, you have some kind of preamble that you have to add in order to adapt it to what is happening. So we will see an example. Sorry about that. Okay. <laughs> so let's go part by part. So we have a class example, right? This we already saw what we get. It's a compile method. And we have the instrument send, right? So we take the bulldog as an argument and evaluates it for the same bytecode. Okay? Is that okay so far? So if then we go into inside this insert inside the block, then we have has one parameter which is actually the the bytecode, and then it executes for each send bytecode in the method. Is that okay? Because we're saying instrument send in the whole in the whole method. Is that okay? So all the sends in the method. And we can have insert before, insert after, and replace. We can even replace each send in the method. And then finally, we said what we would like to have. The thing is that uh, if we have strings here, we have to double quote in order to read these, what is going to be inserted, right? This is going to be compiled and inserted as bytecode. Is that okay? Good. So, uh, how it works is that. So we, we have the bytecode, and we need to go to the IR, right? So here we, we do a decompilation. That, that's the compiler. So basically, by having a compiler, we need a decompiler. And then we go back to the compiler, to the bytecode. So we do this loop up to the IR and then byte to the bytecode. That's the way byte, uh, byte session works. And yeah, so the coding lining is done in, on the IR. Is that OK? for that of which uh, maps offsets of bytecode to where they come from. And that gets, of course, so complicated that the, uh, that the direction we took for the research was to say, go away from bytecode and use that, that abstractivity. But nevertheless, this is a nice uh, tool to have, the, the bytecode transformation. But you need to know that it can get messy as soon as you uh, use it, for example, multiple times on the same machine. One of the things that... Um doing this bytecode to IR to bytecode allows you to do is if you change your class definition uh, and introduce instant variables or remove instant variables, you know the, the, the traditional approach is to, uh, you're going to go over your existing instances and uh, become each one so that the instances change shape with the new code. But you also have to recompile the methods. Well, what VisualWorks does is avoid recompiling the methods and you instead change the indices, the instance variable indices in the bytecode. Right, so it, it scans the bytecoding method, converts them into this, uh, and, and rewrites them so that you know if if if, if the bytecode had said give me the fifth slot, it now be <coughs> give me the fourth slot because you removed the third instance variable. And you can do that in the bytecode. And then the advantage of that is that if you have a special compiler you don't have to have the special compiler loaded, right? So uh, it's a really, really good thing to, to do. Yeah, I think that the, the main difference there is that there you have to know all the complexity of touching the bytecode directly. When here you go back up up uh, an abstraction level, and then you can say, so you. No, no, I, I think this is a better way. No, no, I know. It's just comparing the two the, the two options, right? So here you go up one level, and then you you touch on the IR, and then you just generate it again instead of having to deal with the indexes and a lot of things. 
which sometimes can go terribly wrong. The problem is that it's easy as long as you only have to change from five to six, but if yep. it changes, uh, you get suddenly a bytecode that is longer, then you need to start to rewrite jumps and then yep. you are Yeah, yeah that, that's the problem, right? So dealing with, dealing with this, this abstraction level of bytecode has a terrible semantic gap separation with dealing with what you want to do at code level because what you here you said I want to add this transcript right which you define it here at code level but when you go up down to to the bytecode level IR level uh, bytecode level more, much more the, the semantic gap of one instruction to 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 map it in bytecode is quite high right so it's it's really hard to know where to touch how to touch and what to, so these jumps and all these things that we do not want to deal with right it's kind of hard okay so, what happened to uh, So, so we can we can instrument different things uh, in the bytecode. So we can have uh, instrument send, instrument send bar read, and so on. We have different things going on there. And one thing that we could also do is that extend the send with after login, right? But now, instead of doing a transcript, we are sending self. So this has an extra problem. What if this thing was not there before, right? So for instance, uh, so I want to do this, right? But how can I access? So these have to be, right, inserted. This is not compiled whatsoever right now. So here, what do I put, right? So the problem is that how can we access the receiver of the send in here? Right? Do you understand the problem? So I don't have that in here. So basically what you do is to define something that's called meta variables. Right? You can refer to them, and when this is going to be instrumented right, in the bytecode, then this is going to be replaced by the, by the, the receiver, or self in this case. Is that okay? Questions? Good. Uh, what is happening, this is what, what I said before, there's this preamble that, so then the problem is that, so you have your stack, right? So you have argument one, argument two, and the receiver in the stack. And then what you need is to have the result there. And so you have two problems. So after the send, receives, uh, the, the receiver is not available, right? After the send, because you consume it. And the second problem is before the send, receiver is deep in the stack. So when, at this point, you have to execute this like, okay, log, and you send, and you send uh, self. So the problem is that the stack is kind of, tweak it differently than what you actually need. So either, either you change, the, you have to add something in order to make it work. So the solution is to have this, uh, to pop the arguments and then pop, uh, push them in the way that you need. And actually for that, what you do is to have this, can you see that? All right, that the important part anyway is this part here, is the preamble, right? So basically what we're doing is storing what we need in the, in the order that we need, and then we access that in the line code. Is that okay? Okay. So, let's go fast to the, so questions so far. All right. So, I want to go back to why do we care. So, this is all what we have seen is really low level, right? But what's the big picture? So, what can we achieve by doing this? So I'm going to talk about these three that I already talked before, but very quickly, and then we go to lunch. Anybody has an objection on that? Okay, good. So this is Alvetia. Uh, this is the work of, uh, yeah, there. It took some time. So this is the work of Lucas for his thesis. And what you can see here is that uh, the compiler, right? Here is a traditional compiler, but basically, the, the compiler that we have, depending on the needs that you have, so these are these three three things that you see here are different kinds of ESLs. They have particularities of which I'm not going to describe them. Basically, is that they have uh, they need and they, they represent different languages and different features in the language. So basically, each of them has a different transformation pattern on top of the compiler. So we can hook depending on which one of them we we want to implement. And we can go into different parts, so each of them requires a different transformation on the process of the compiler. So by having this decoupled compiler, we can get in between, right, and transform the parts that we need depending on the DSL that we need. That's a general picture, okay? And this is quite uh, powerful. Actually, one part of Helvetia, do you know Petty Parser, 
right? Which is going to be explained afterwards. Petty parser doesn't work on top of this, but it's part of the whole framework, so it's quite powerful, right? And the basic idea is that it works on top of that. Another thing is what Marcus did for his thesis, and the basic idea here, I, I talked before about reflex and that you do the the you are doing adaptation to the bytecode level, right? And what Marcus realized is that the semantic gap is so so high that what if we do this adaptation at the AST level, for instance? So we he moved all his uh, all, all his structures and, um, and framework to do this adaptation at the AST level. So basically, what you do is you take an AST and you attach something that's called a link, and every time that this node is going to be executed, something else that's what the link uh, specifies. Something else should happen. So you adapt the behavior of the code on the AST. And by doing that, you, you don't have to deal with all these particularities of the bytecode, right? You look at the AST, it's much closer to the code, and you can reflect on top of it much simpler. Is that okay? Questions? Okay, and the last tool is what I'm working for my thesis, which is called Albedo. And it's, it's kind of the, the next step in this uh, behavioral reflection world, which would be basically what I did is kind of generalize the problem instead of having just meta objects. So instead of having links to ASTs, I remove the links and you can attach meta objects to any object in the image and change the behavior from a modeling point of view. So you take any option and say, okay, now you, I want you to be, you have a class based system, right? I want you, instead of being a class-based system, I want you to be a prototype. So I attach a meta objects that describe how a prototype should work. And you have an instance specific way of doing, uh, of, do, of doing adaptation, and you can change pieces of your language to behave in a different reflective domain, right? You can have, you can refine uh, some things that are not there, so the idea is to have the dynamic verifications, as for instance, uh, message sense. So message sense are not in small talk, right? You cannot refi, you don't have an object that represents a message sent. It's eh? a magic we have. It's a magic. Message sent. Yeah. And message sent implemented on the M side, and the semantic of message sent is uh, not changeable. You cannot change it in, in, from the language side. Only on this domain. Yeah. But, but that's, yeah, that's what I'm saying, that you can do it in a different way. That's what's new. It's not new. Actually, a lot of people have tried that, and they have implemented different things. So there are like at least five different frameworks. What I'm saying here is that this is a framework for defining new verification. So message sense is one example. You will perhaps want to have something else, right? So message receive, state read, state write, whatever, any event. So basically what I'm saying is that you can refine your things and reflect on them and we have like two worlds. You have the structural world, which is I want you to be a prototype, a class, whatever. And then you have the behavior world in which you see your system as a set of events. The execution to finish something is a set of events. So I send you all these messages, I do all these accesses or whatever. Whatever verification you want to have. Okay? Okay. So thank you very much. Sorry for the mistakes, and I will send the slides to Marcus, or, or otherwise. Okay, I'll send the slides to Marcus, or perhaps I send it directly to the mailing list, and we can discuss around. Thank you very much. So for the program for tomorrow, we have. So for the program for tomorrow, so.